Good morning, church. Let's all be standing as we jump into worship this morning. I want to welcome you to our worship service this morning at Gateway. I want to welcome those who are tuning in online. Let's sing out this morning. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. Hey, 
Hey Gateway, thanks so much for joining us. Here's some things to highlight for you. The community outreach is collecting new or gently used coats and blankets of all sizes until this Friday, December 10th. These items will be distributed at our second Saturday meal on December 11th. Please make sure all blankets are lightweight and small enough to be rolled and carried. All donations can be brought to the community outreach closet located in the gym. If you have any questions, please see Derek Hancock. If you're interested in helping with the second Saturday meal for our community outreach on December 11th, please sign up at the Connect Center so the team can see where best to place all of our volunteers. The Soul Sister Christmas Party will be December 11th at 5.30 p.m. here at the building. Make sure you save the date and be listening out for more details. The Gateway Student Ministry Christmas is December 12th at the Mallory's House starting at 5.30 p.m. Please see Jessica Medeiros for more details. The Marriage Ministry Christmas Party is December 17th at La Hacienda in Milton. Bring a wrapped ornament for Dirty Santa and sign up at the Connect Center by December 12th to attend. Mark your calendars for February 18th and 19th for our annual Marriage Ministry Retreat. This amazing event will be held here at the building with guest speaker Buddy Bell. More details will be available very soon, so be listening out. Our Gateway Children's Christmas Program and Christmas Sanctuary is December 19th at 5.30 p.m., followed by light refreshments. We'll also be streaming this awesome event on Facebook. We hope to see you there. If you'd like more info on anything going on here at Gateway, stop by the Connect Centers and talk to a team member. Thanks for joining us. Well, good morning, church. All right. Who's happy to be here today, church? Let me hear it. It is December. Oh, it's a wonderful time of the year. Um, one of the things about this season of Advent, though, which that word Advent, it means waiting. One of the things about this season that is so real and is so exciting is, is it does not ignore the darkness. You notice that, right? It doesn't ignore maybe the, the, the pain of the moment. It doesn't ignore the chaos of life but then it says but the light is coming amen church the light is coming and so i love this season because i love driving around and seeing the christmas lights because several years ago i remember saying to myself what i'm going to do is every time i see one of these beautiful silly fun decorations i'm going to think about the fact that this is the time where we realize that the light has overcome the darkness and every time I see something, a, a, a random Christmas tree decorated through a window, I want to remind myself that no matter how dark things are, no matter how painful things can be, the light has overcome the darkness. And that's why I love coming into this space on Sunday morning, lifting up our voices in worship and in prayer because we are saying to each other and we are saying through our worship that we believe in this hope. We believe in this light. Do we believe in this light, church? Yes, we believe in this light. Now, there's one of the things that I love about what, what we try to do here is, is we understand that as that light overcomes the darkness, as we've allowed our lives to be transformed, we can't keep that to ourselves. In Luke 11, it says that when the light fills you up, it actually begins to pour out of all aspects of yourself. And you've heard so many things on the video announcements, and I hope that you have your, your bulletin, but there are so many moments here in this time that we want to serve. We want to look out into the community, into the dark, and say, hey, if we've got the light and it's pouring out of us, we want to bring the light into that community that needs it. So yesterday, uh, our, our team, our, our members did the Without Walls ministry, which is nothing more than just going and just being with people in the name of Jesus, playing and providing food and inviting them to come and, and to worship with us and to enjoy things with us. Several of our members were there. And of course, as you heard in the announcements, this Sunday, we have our second Saturday meal. Now, y'all know we've done this for years. We've done this for years, but we had to take a break. We had to take a break because we didn't have a space. And we didn't have a, uh, we didn't have, of course, we had COVID for that time period. And so what our ministry did is they adjusted and they created camps and corners where they said, you know what? If they can't come to us, we're going to bring the light to them. Well, now we have this space and they say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do both of them. We're going to let people come here. We're going to feed them. But then we're going to turn around and we're going to go back out. In Romans chapter 12 verse 6 it says in his grace god has given us different gifts for doing certain things well 
So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is encourage, is encouragement, then be encouraging. If it's giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. I love that list of gifts because it's things that we do in our day-to-day -day life. Have we ever thought about kindness being a spiritual gift? Well, it is. When we are kind in the name of Jesus, we are revealing Jesus to the person we are being kind to. But then it says, if you have the gift of service, then serve with everything that you have. And I believe that as a body of Christ, when you join in with the body of Christ and Jesus has transformed your life, I will go as far to say that I think the gift of service instills all of us because Jesus washed feet and then said, do as I do. Right, church? So we need to be serving. What we're doing this Saturday is just one example. And the reason I'm talking about it is because it's coming. It's coming this week. You've heard it said uh, several times during the announcements that there's an ongoing donation. There is a coat and a scarf drive uh, uh, that's happening. Uh, excuse me, a blanket drive. Participate. But one of the things this ministry needs are perpetual donations to keep it running. And so I actually brought it up here with me this morning. In our gym, in the corner, this is hanging on a door. It's very simple. And you walk up to it, and on these cards, it tells you exactly what they need. You grab this card with you on a Sunday, on a Wednesday, whenever you're up here. And when you go to the store, you purchase what is on that card, you bring it up here, and if no one is here to receive it from you, you just go put it back there in the corner of the gym. Now, it feels like it's a little tucked away. That's why I wanted some of y'all to see it, because some of y'all haven't even gone in the gym yet. You should. Here it is. This is what it is. This is an ongoing act of service you can participate in from here until whenever. They are always in need of it. And I wanted you guys to see that that is just one of the ways that we want to continue to practice the gift of service. I want to invite you all to stand on your feet, church. Let's stand on your feet. We are going to take a moment. We're going to greet one another. We're going to say hello. We are going to extend the gift of kindness and encouragement at this time as we continue on in our worship. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Life and salvation, His empire brings. Joy to the nations, for Jesus is King. And come, let us. 
song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need, and lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. And come, let us sing a song, a song declaring that we belong to Jesus. He's all we need, and lift up a heart of praise, and sing now with voices raised to Jesus. And come, let us sing a song, a song declaring that we belong to Jesus. Dear God, thank you for letting us come into your presence and, and worship you, that we get to have a personal relationship with the creator of everything. And it's such a humbling thought that, that we have access to such power. Help us to uh, not just bring, bring this energy from worship 
with us throughout the week, but help us to live a life of worship and bring that here and give that as, a, as an offering to you. Help us to, to lead the lives that, that you want us to lead. We thank, thank you for your son who died for us, that, that we can have this relationship with you, that we can be with you someday. And help us to always lean on you for, for our strength. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Getting ready to commune around the table this morning, just like we do every Sunday, and it's just as special today as it is any other Sunday. It should mean so much to us. But in this season, you know, we we point towards the time when when Christ came to this earth. He came as a baby, lived as a a boy and a man, growing up with his parents and in a in a humble upbringing. The song we sing here says, above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things. As Don prayed, he was here when the world was made, he made the world. And as the song says, you were here before the world began. But yet when he was here, he humbled himself and lowered himself to nothing. All for us, all for you. I'm going to invite, if you will, to stand if you are able to as we sing this song and then we will commune together. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man. You Thank you. 
I was uh, eight years old and I was watching this football game and my team got beat on a 52-yard field goal as time expired. Legend has it, I went downstairs into our basement, locked myself in our, our family van and cried. <laughs> you know, we love our sports teams. If you don't follow sports, you don't have a sports team, you know, put an activity or a hobby that you have the passion that we have and carry for that is, is really unrivaled. And the question I want to ask this morning is, do you have that same passion and that same intensity to follow Jesus? When you showed up today, did you put thought into the drive here? Did you put thought into the worship that you were about to do? Did you put that passion and that energy and that intensity? Did you think about how you could serve somebody today in this building, how you could love somebody today. Did you put thought and, and uh, just intentionality to it instead of just showing up? In Mark 14, we, we see Jesus in a spot that we didn't, haven't seen him before. He's troubled. He's, he says his soul is sorrowful. And he's sitting in that garden, and he's crying out to his father in heaven, saying, Abba, Father. He's like, you can do anything. Can this cup pass from me? You can, if you wanted it, Lord, you could do that. You could let this pass over me. But not my will, but yours be done. And I think about that as, as a dad, looking at my sons who, who would be crying out to me. And he did that to send his son on the cross to die for, for me, for you, for each one of us. So we should be able to look at the garden. We should be able to look at, at the cross and never question the love that God has for us. So where is your passion and your focus, your energy and your intensity? Will you bow with me? Dear God, we're humbled. Humbled to know that, that the creator of the universe, the one who, who spoke the world into existence, would think about us and who had this plan of redemption. At this time, as we take of this bread, which is symbolic of the body of, of Jesus, it reminds us of what you gave up to save us from our sins. Help us to, to take this in a manner that's well-pleasing to you. In doing so, we look back at the cross, but we look forward to his, his glorious return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray again. We come before you again, Lord, just thanking you for the, the sacrifice of Jesus. We thank you for his obedience, for his humbleness, 
Thank you for this, this cup, which is symbolic of the blood that um, was shed so freely and innocently for us. Help us to, to take this in a manner with the right mind and in a manner that's well-pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the time that we set aside in our worship for us to give back to the Lord from what we've been prospered. Um, I would only ask you, if you received a bulletin, some have recently asked, uh, which ways are the preferred method of giving? I would say every single one of them. And so um, they are listed, though, uh, in your bulletin. So if you have, uh, have had question about that, you could either do it through your Alexio app, you can use text to give feature, you can um, give directly, you can write check, um, any way you choose, but this is that moment. So let's go to God in prayer and uh, ask him to bless our offering today. Father, you tell us in scripture to uh, give back to you. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, it was a command to give 10% from what we'd been prospered. In your New Testament, you say to give out of a cheerful heart and to give liberally. Help us, Father, to approach the process of giving as a joy and a celebration. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Kind of continuing the Just Like Him series, but we're calling it Behold the Lamb. So it's just kind of a continuation of the life of Jesus. And uh, I'm excited about this time of year always. It's a time when the world seems to kind of change mindsets a little bit. And we as Christians can kind of take hold of that, if you will, and take advantage of that fact that they are looking a little more intently. And so as we uh, stand and sing this song, O Come All You Faithful, it says, O Come, Let Us Adore Him. We should be living our lives in a way that adores Christ and shows Him to the world. Let's all stand. O come, all ye faithful, joyful, Oh, come. 
and no come let us Be seated. Every time around this year, the world focuses in on a little infant child, the Son of God. It beholds it. There's something special about the word behold. It means to see something remarkable. Not just to see it, but to see something that, that you can't explain to see something that you're in awe of. Matter of fact, you have beheld many things. Many of you are beholding something remarkable right now. <laughs> many of you, for you, you, held, you beheld your bride as she walked down the aisle. That was something remarkable, right? Many of you, you, you beheld your children as they played with their first puppy. Or you beheld your children as they played together on the trampoline. Sometimes I find myself at the window watching Connor and Abby Grace jump with Tyler and, and, and really, really, kind of, they don't want to be on that trampoline. They're beyond trampoline age. But they'll play together and he has so much joy and I behold that moment. For me, it's being in the mountains and staring out at just how majestic the mountains are, especially snow-covered mountains. I could behold that forever. This time of year, we behold the Lamb. We behold the Lamb. Many of us know the Lamb. We've studied about Jesus. We've known Jesus. We have given our lives to Jesus. But what does it mean to behold the Lamb? I'm afraid that in our culture, it is too difficult to behold the Lamb because we're too busy to behold anything. Matter of fact, for some of us, we don't behold much. Because to behold something means that you have to be still long enough to appreciate it. For me, I want to behold more of Jesus. But if I don't spend enough time with Jesus, I won't behold Jesus. I will reference Jesus. I will use Jesus to my advantage, to make me feel better, to make me feel special, to make me feel more saved. I will use Jesus. But how often do we literally slow down enough to behold something? Last week, we talked about being in the Word and what it means to study and and the fact that we, can, we fool ourselves into thinking that church is enough, that gathering is enough, it's not enough. We have to slow down and be involved in the Word because if we're involved in what the Word says and how it instructs and how it, how it guides and how it pierces, then we can behold the message of what God is trying to tell us. There is a statement that you're going to hear in the clip in a minute that says people must know 
And I am, I'm convinced that we all, when it, become, when it comes to evangelism, we, we believe in this statement. We believe that people must know. But this was a different type of statement. This was a statement about the Son of God coming into the world, having experienced this miracle through an angelic appearance. Shepherds were out in the field. We'll read it in a moment. And an angel of the Lord appears. But it also says that after the angel of the Lord appeared, a heavenly host of angels... I want you to experience, it carried with it this light, this, this magnificent heavenly light. But this host of angels can only be described in the millions. It's not like there's an angel up there and he says, you know, you're going to see the Son of God. I do a terrible angel impression. <laughs> You'll see the Son of God, he's over there. Get going. That's more like a trucker. I don't know. But anyways, but there he is. And he says something spectacular. And sometimes we have this image of like 10 angels walking up behind him. What he said. But instead, it's literally kind of a silhouette of millions of angels that accompanied this one angel. And the shepherds don't know what to do. <laughs> They're just standing there watching this sight. This is not something they normally see. Normally, the only white thing they see are sheep. And they are in awe. They are beholding something remarkable. And then the angel instructs them to go. They are leaving this remarkable sight to behold something more remarkable than that sight. A baby that is not glowing, that is not all clean and wiped off, that is dirty, that is in a manger, surrounded by poverty, surrounded by uh, uh, animals, this sight to them is more to behold than millions of angels standing in our presence. Sometimes I feel like we lose sight of how magnificent it was to behold the Son of God. Pay attention to this clip.
so beautiful. <laughs> we must tell someone. <laughs> we must tell everyone. We must tell everyone. Everyone. Yes. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't do this for so long. So long. He's on. He's on. He's on. He's on. He's on. He's on. Oh, it's okay. What will you name him? Jesus. You will name him Jesus. I must go. People must know. People must know. People must know. shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. To establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. read it together. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, going through 18. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it, were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Sometimes I wonder if we talk about Jesus in such a way that it amazes those who hear it rolling off our tongue. For us, in our society, talking about Jesus is quite taboo. It's quite frightening. What are we afraid of? Losing our life? No, not really. Losing some clout? Possibly. People think we're weirdos. Some of those Jesus fanatics. Ah, oh, he's religious. Oh, it's true. To some people, that happens. We had an interaction recently, Jennifer and I, reacting to a situation with someone in our neighborhood who was highly intoxicated and, and, and had this unfortunate occurrence happen and Jennifer begins to walk with the individual to try to cool her down and I, I began to go and try to minister to the other other side of things 
And Jennifer said, let's pray together. And she responded, I don't want to be judged. Boy, what is it about carrying the name of Jesus that makes people feel judged? Well, I know I've got answers to that. But also, we know we've caused some of that. I wish that we could change the way people perceive Jesus when we talk about Jesus. I wish we could talk about Jesus in such a way where we convince people that they know they don't have to be perfect to follow him. They don't have to have all the right answers. They don't have to have the, the ultimate perfect theology to follow Jesus. I wish when they heard us talk about Jesus, they saw excitement. They see joy. They experience hope. I wish that when they heard us talk about Jesus, they see all of those elements inside of us and they go, I want that. Some of us, we talk about vacation destinations with more passion than we do about Jesus, the Savior of mankind. We talk about our kids' birthdays. We talk about events that occur in our lives. We talk about politics. We talk about all sorts of things. That if we're not careful, it overshadows the greatest thing that we should, that anyone should ever behold, which is the Lamb of God. The shepherds see this sight. They literally take off running. But what about shepherds? I mean, why shepherds? Shepherds carried a a connotation. Matter of fact, they carried many. For many, the fact that Jesus appeared to, or the, 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 the angels, the heavenly host appeared to the shepherds first, is a sign that it's humble beginnings for a humble king. Believe it or not, not everybody liked shepherds. This is a quote from Aristotle in his uh, opus Ovid. Among men, the laziest are shepherds who lead an idle life and get their subsistence without trouble and from tame animals. <laughs> Aristotle clearly was not a fan of shepherds. Now, luckily for me, Aristotle is not somebody I put my faith and hope in. So what about these, 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 these lazy shepherds? Well, to be true, shepherds don't smell the best. They don't look the best. They're out in the fields, sometimes days at a time. They're dirty. They're there to watch over the flock. And some of us have this kind of idea that watching over the flock means that you walk around with a kind of a, a crooked staff, you know, it's got the hook on the end of it. And then we walk around and we, we kind of keep our eyes on the horizon. It's kind of got this idea that, that it's, you know, this desert, right? And true, it's very desert-like. Untrue, it's not flat. It's craggy. It's mountainous. It's rugged. If you can imagine tumbleweeds in Texas, in Arizona, that's what they have there. It's very similar. There's certain times of year where everything is green and lush and they could go, and, but for the most part, that's not always the case. But I don't know if you know or not, the Bible talks about shepherds, especially those around the town of Bethlehem in Jerusalem, as manning a watchtower. Matter of fact, the watchtower is called Migdal Iter, Migdal Iter, the tower of the flock. Matter of fact, Micah, the prophet, talks about it, Micah 4.8. As for you, watchtower of the flock, stronghold of daughter Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. Kingship will come to daughter Jerusalem. So what does Migdal Iter have to do with this? Well, this kind of gives you a picture of the ruins of the possible Migdal Iter. This stands on the top of a hill. It has windows. It's about three stories tall. And the chief shepherd would actually go up into the tower and spend his night very much like a fire tower here that we might see, you know, if we're driving up to Bear Lake or something like that, up in Munson. 
and they would watch out over the flock, flocks below. Nearby, it's very interesting because most scholars believe that the shepherds were not necessarily looked down upon, such as Aristotle looked down upon them, but they were actually held in high regard, high esteem. Matter of fact, they were priestly because the flocks that they looked after were temple flocks. From one of the writings of the Mishnah, which is the uh, verbal tradition of the Jews, they write this. These shepherds would have been performing priestly duties, raising sheep of the temple flock for sacrifice out in the fields near town. In other words, they are looking after the choicest of lambs. The choicest of lambs. The, 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 the cream of the crop. The ones without blemish, they would raise these for sale so that they could sacrifice them. That sacrifice, sacrificial system would, would kind of weigh down on them. They would actually be pretty expensive to pick one of these up. Hebrews 10, 18 says, And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. What is Hebrews talking about? Hebrews is actually a quotation from the book of Jeremiah, where it's alluded to that at the presence, at the announcement of this Messiah, whoever that would be, that it would, it would symbolize that the sacrificial system of slaughtering lambs for sin is now done. It's over. So I fast forward you to these priestly Shepherds, when they receive this news, it's not as if it's just a bunch of dumb guys in a field with staffs walking around hanging out with sheep. They're actually well skilled at their craft. They know the Torah. They know about what's been prophesied. So when this announcement comes down from angelic voices... They know that the answer, the answer to their sacrificial system has just arrived. John 129 regards Jesus as this. It says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's not, look, here comes the Lamb of God who makes things better. It's not, look, here comes the Lamb of God. He lowers our taxes. It's not, look, here comes the Lamb of God. He gives us freedom. It's not, look, here comes the Lamb of God. He bails me out sometimes. It is, look, here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You would think that if somebody has taken away the sin of the world, that it's quite a big deal. You would think that if somebody has taken away the sin of the world, it almost would suggest that we pour more energy into that which takes away the sin of the world rather than everything else that takes up the majority of our energy. You belong to an awesome church. This is a wonderful place. But occasionally, occasionally, I hear whispers, frustrations, aggravations, emails, an occasional phone call with suggestions. That's fine. That's great. But when the spirit of those comes in and the spirit of those is unchristlike, or the spirit of those suggests that things around here aren't perfect enough and I'm frustrated with these Christians here, I kind of get annoyed. If you haven't realized that you are surrounded by imperfect people yet, go outside and reread the sign. If you, haven't, if you think that I have it all together, and in preaching messages that the Lord gives me because of my righteousness, you have fooled yourself. 
I only stand here because I feel that God placed a calling on my life to say, Behold the Lamb. Look at Jesus. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the one that we look to so that when we look to him, he gives us inspiration to live. Not some fancy quote that I sit there and, and, and try, to, try to mingle together and, and, and wordsmith together so it inspires you. Oh, these people aren't evangelistic enough. They don't disciple enough. They don't serve enough. They don't... Do you do any of those things? <laughs> oh, man, from the mouth of babes. That baby just convicted every single one of y'all. <laughs> If I came to you and gave you the most precious gift you could possibly ever receive, it is priceless, it is, it is worth so much, you would take that gift and probably wonder, for me? <laughs> Don't you have children? Aren't you married? Don't you love them? But I'm giving it to you. I, but don't you, I mean, seriously, you are giving me something that is of greater value. Like this is worth more than your house is worth. This would get you out of debt. This would, this would solve your financial dilemmas. This would, no, but I'm giving it to you. But I don't deserve it. It's exactly what Jesus is. And when I tell you to behold the lamb, it is, not, it is not a phrase. It is not a platitude. It is a command. It is a strong suggestion for you to slow down long enough to be by yourself and behold that which literally took away the sins of the world. He put them on his back. He nailed them to a tree. And he conquered death so that you might have eternal life. And we sometimes don't have enough time for it. Boy, sometimes some people need to be shaken. I need to be shaken, shaken. Slow down. Pause. Go off by yourself. Behold the Lamb. This morning, we have an invitation. And it's a little bit different. We don't have all the tables man, but um, we're going to have a couple over here at this prayer station. I will be up here. If you need prayer for anything this morning, if you are, 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 are on the fence, you've been riding the fence a long time about committing your life to the Lord and getting baptized, and you just never have made the commitment, one of us would love to talk to you about that. But please, whatever you do, don't just sit there. Sit there and pray for people's hearts to be, to be moved. But most definitely leave here beholding the Lamb. If there's anything you need, please let it be known as we stand and while we sing. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Jerusalem
Week after week, I give an invitation, and I'm able to come up here and um, and read off prayer requests. And um, with Ryan and Kelly over there, sit, look at them all. Just everybody, look at Ryan and Kelly. Make them feel as awkward as you possibly can. Um, the the goal for what we're going to be doing here is to have this prayer station, that prayer station, that prayer station, and the the door right there is a prayer room. Uh, where if you need private prayers, one of the elders and their wives will be there to pray with you, with and for you. Um, it is actually being occupied right now, um, uh, being prayed over, uh, praying over somebody. We're excited about this. We want this to occur. We want to be a church that prays more, that talks to the Lord about everything. And so it's on that note, before these guys come up, that I want to uh, announce a very something very special. Um, you'll remember last week we read a letter by uh, Amy Ray talking about her dad who has been cancer free for 20 years from stage four cancer and they found a growth in his abdomen and there was the doctors said this is, this is it this is cancer and um, and so so he went they took the biopsy they did everything they could and you prayed and that was false it is benign there is no cancer Yep. And we, we don't understand it. We don't know. We believe in faith. God says, if you ask, I will give. And so we do. We do. We don't ever know with 100% assurance. However, that prayer is going to be answered, but we know it will be answered. And so, um, so we wanted to rejoice with Amy as she rejoices in that good news. Ole Olson's going to come up uh, along with uh, David Chandler. And, um, well, I'll just let them do that. Liz, Seth, and um, Matt. <laughs> I want to say Mike. I don't know. That's Liz, Seth, and Mike. Matt, come up, Matt. I know you. I've known you all my life, and when I see a Mike, I get uncomfortable. They're going to be leaving tomorrow for uh, Lithuania. Um, we uh, we've had a uh, mission there for some, quite some time. In fact, I think. Um, well, since Danny Dodd was here, I guess. Uh, these guys are going to um, be ministering to the, the church there. They're also going to be looking for ways that we can become more involved uh, with um, the work there, more uh, personally involved with the work there. We pray for them. We send them uh, uh, some support. But, um, and, uh, you know, Matt's been... Uh, involved with the uh, camp there every summer for I don't know how many years now, Matt. Um, how many? Since, you've known you all Since I've known him all your life, and he's not Mike. This is Matt. Uh, I, this is you know. I'm glad Glenda's not in here. She will not let me forget this, and I don't expect you to tell. Her. So, in any event, um, I want you. Uh, you know, we we talk about uh, when when uh, those of us that go out. Uh, into the world. We should be praying for each other. Um, they're going uh, across a large ocean and into a, a very cold land. And, uh, but we know that the hearts of the Lithuanians there are, are warm, and we're going to pray now for them. And we'll, we'll, this will be our dismissal as, as we go forward also to our, our mission field. Father, we, uh, we thank you, Lord, for uh, being perfect. And we thank you, God, that we have um, your son, which covers our obvious imperfections, that we can uh, have your spirit, which you've given to us as believers and, and will give us uh, a ability to, to know how and what to do if we just open up to that spirit, Lord. Uh, for uh, Matt, Liz, and Seth, God, we just pray that you would physically keep them safe uh, during this time. But Lord, just uh, put an extra measure of, of your spirit in front of them to know how to minister best to the Lithuanians and how 
they can find ways that we can, as a church body, uh, do that as well going forward in the future. We thank you for them. We thank you for their heart. And we just ask you, God, to, to uh, wrap your, your spirit around them in, in protection, but also in knowledge and wisdom of how, how to best serve. Lord, we ask that for our whole congregation. We ask for all those that are sitting now in, in chairs and that have things that, that, that are troubling them, that they're um, not giving up yet. We ask, God, that your spirit envelops them, that you, you are able to minister and allow us to minister them. Also, God, we ask you as we go out that we look around us, that we see and find ways that we can help those around us that um, are in need in so many different ways. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this time today. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.